Everybody, welcome to The Social Hour. My guest today is an amazing cinematographer. I can't wait to get into the meat of this conversation. Let me introduce you to Pedro Luque. He is a Uruguayan-born, award-winning cinematographer and director of photography who currently calls Los Angeles home. He studied film at Escuela de Cine de yeah. Uruguay, <laughs> the premier and first ever Uruguayan well institution done. dedicated specifically to professional training in film and video. Pedro graduated in 2004 and quickly made a name for himself in the cinematography world and is now represented by the acclaimed iconic talent agency. As a member of the renowned Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, Pedro is best known for his work on films such as Extinction, Don't Breathe, The Girl in the Spider's Web, and most recently for the historically inspired thriller that we'll be talking about today, Antebellum. His brilliant work is not just centered around cinematography for feature films. Pedro has also lended his creative vision to commercials, music videos, and documentaries. He's a visual master who is capable of evoking precise emotions in his work of cinematic genius. Welcome today, Pedro Luque. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm completely blushing right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You got to own that. You got to own that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I, I will. I try. Yes, no, I'm super excited. Um, so I actually got to watch the film and was really blown away, um, especially by, as a photographer myself, I'm of course in love with lighting. So um, there was a lot of things I wanted to talk to you about, but before we get into the meat of the movie and how you shot that, I would love to know what drew you to cinematography in the first place? Well, it's weird because I don't know how we how I ended up, but I was always kind of uh, directing myself into visual something, right? My dad is an architect, and I always uh, draw drawing. You know, and we always had paper and stuff. And my dad is a very good; he now paints, and uh, and he he taught me some stuff. And then I was into uh, well, uh, one of the things that he did. My mom too, but. My dad owed me so much, some money, believe it or not. I was a very hardworking uh, kid and uh, I, I lent some money to him. And because he couldn't pay me back, he gave me his camera. He gave me like a, oh. a, like a, a Canon FT. It was a film camera with a, with a 50 and a, and a Zoom. So I was into the music scene, playing hardcore punk and uh, following my friends' bands. And I started photographing that. And, uh, and I was always very interested in comic books. And at one point we said, well, there was another friend and he said like, what we should do, you know, when you're 18 and you need to choose what you're going to be the rest of your life, which is one of the most stupid things that I, that it's I can like, no think pressure, of. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You're 18. Okay. Now what are you going to do the rest of all those years that you still have for, and, uh, and we ended up landing on film, on film school, right? We, I mean, it was kind of a conscious, uh, uh, choice you know you, we had like okay sequential storytelling in comic books you know music uh painting and uh, I, and, and uh, on film school I did everything right I was already working because I got my first job as a prop assistant in 1999 believe it or not I was 18 and I and uh, the the place where I was going to learn to how to paint the my teacher my mentor he got the opportunity to do the production design on a movie and he and this is Uruguay which is very small and it, you know at, at that time it wasn't that so developed uh, as, uh, as it is now which is a little bit more and uh, and he told me hey you are starting film school don't you want to go come on, and work with me on this movie and I said like, yeah sure for free obviously yeah. and sure, I couldn't yeah. believe it and there was this DP here there, there was that the, there, there was an EP there uh, named uh, um, Pato Rodriguez, which is, he, he had made movies with Eliseo Subiela, which is an Argentinian director. And he was so loving with the camera and the lighting. And I was like, hmm, look at that guy, he cares. And I, I remember we were shooting that movie in Betacam, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I remember knowing that the Betacam was a piece of shit. <laughs> It wasn't a real camera. And the guy was treating, and all the crew was treating the camera as a real camera. And I was like, oh, wait, you know, it's not just about, you know, the gear you may have. Because the movie looked amazing. 
you know, I will go. And that guy started to teach me some stuff. He will say like, hey, Pedro, come over here. Uh, now you have to do this and that. Look at the monitor and check that. And, and I learned a little bit with that guy. And, uh, and then on film school, I was already like, and I think, I think I felt comfortable on the, on, with the camera and the lights. And I worked a lot. There were there weren't there weren't many uh, cinematographers on, on my film school. I think we were like two or three that were actually super dedicated to it. And I ended up like shooting like twenty short films when I came out of film school. Wow! So so it was quite an experience. Imagine, but 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 I had like one minute of semi interesting images, right? And I put I condensed all those images together. It's like it's like the other we were kidding with a friend. It's like our anti-real. It's way bigger than our real, right? All the things we did wrong. All the uh, I mean, it's that's huge. But well, I got you know one minute of stuff, and I came out and started to you know, and the same guy, the same DP. Um, I was doing everything because I, I worked as an AD. I worked as a PA, of course. I worked as a camera assistant. And uh, at one point, this guy told me, like, I worked, I was working as a location manager at that point. Okay. Uh, and this DP friend, uh, mentor, he told me, hey, if you, if you really want to be a director of photography, the next time they call you for one of that, those things you are doing now, you should tell them that you are working as a cinematographer. Right, I was like 24, and uh, and uh, and I went like, okay. They call me and I say that, you know, and uh, and it's like, do you want to see my reel? And they went, yeah, send it over, right? And after a couple attempts, it, it started to happen. Like people like Fede Alvarez, he was uh, starting to be a director, starting to work. I I I have crossed him. He was an editor on this company. And uh, he was starting on this kind of new uh, production company, and he wanted to have people of his age, you know, working with him. Sure. And, uh, and we had the opportunity of shooting a lot of commercials and uh, do a lot of crazy stuff. But I ended up being a cinematographer. It was it was good. <laughs> That's crazy. I love hearing these stories of how people come to be where they're at when I interview them because there's sometimes it's I always knew what I wanted to be since the time I was a little kid and sometimes it's that it just kind of happened that way it's crazy yeah so yeah. I imagine you're not but, too upset with where you're at though no 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 I love it it's tough though huh? it's a tough it's a tough job uh but I think there's nothing I would do you know I wouldn't wake up at 4 a.m. for for anything else maybe the family you know but yeah but maybe maybe <laughs> maybe but anything else you know and then you they say like okay your your call is at 4 30 and uh, i was discussing this with a friend yesterday also like uh we were talking about the morning light and how beautiful is it right and i and i was saying like the amount of times i tortured people with that because i've overheard what the fuck? 4 a.m. call? Who the fuck is coming up with these times? And I'm like, we need to have the techno ready in the middle of the forest at for sunrise. Yeah. Uh, but then at the end, it's worth it. You know, it's going to live forever. Um, yeah. The picture. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that tough. actually leads me into the first question that I had um, about okay. Antebellum. So the first thing I noticed, of course, with the opening of the film is this long single shot. And I thought oh, yeah. that it was such a great, so you start in the beginning and there's this beautiful little girl running through this idyllic scene that's lit by this beautiful sunset light and it just feels so gorgeous. And then you slowly kind of transform as we're going through to this really kind of hideous where in the movie where the the slaves are living where there's this you know the light is changed there's no more glowing golden light everything is now much more diffuse and the color palette is much kind of lower and more somber and how hard was it to get that shot and what was it like planning for not just the long shot and all of the movement but also that change in light yeah it was it was pretty tough uh we had a great assistant director 
with a lot of experience. And, uh, and we actually tried that shot like four days in a row. Um, uh, it, these are two shots stitched together, sadly. But I mean, I, I, sometimes, you know, I, I shot a movie that is a, a single shot, a sequence shot uh, horror film that we shot in 2009. It was a horror film. And it was like 11 uh, shots put together. And there was always that discussion, oh, how difficult it is to do this very long shot. And I always think that that the difficulty of doing it, it's something that it's more like interesting for us techni techni te uh, technicians in a way, you know, that we know how difficult it is to move a camera and, and coordinate all that, all those, all that people and coordinate all the elements and the sun and the light and, and um, but but in the end, I think what's important is the the, the what the audience feels, right? That right. I think that a, a continuous take has that thing, that tension that keeps on growing and growing, because there's something. There's it's kind of related to I don't know I don't know if you read that book in the blink of an eye, the the Walter Murch book about editing and sound editing. He discovered he was he was the editor of Coppola and he would he would do sound. He's a genius, total genius. And he discovered that editing, that usually when he was going to make the cut, like the scene, okay, this shot is over here. It was when or about when the actor was about to blink, right? And he started to make this connection between how we blink in, in normal life. And he says, like, okay, when you're panning your eyes, you usually blink in the middle because that's information, and that's a cut in a way. You know, you cut from this scene to that scene, and and uh, and another thing he did is like it's like when when actors act, right? And uh, uh, or when someone is like really mad and it's, he knows exactly what he wants to say, he doesn't blink, and he's like that. But when someone is really mad and he's confused, he's constantly uh, uh, blinking, and uh, and I think that the continuous shot has that thing you're not blinking you know you're like put right. into that thing and going all the way and it's it starts to build up and build up and build up so we we tried this shot for four days we obviously uh we found that that path was the best i was interested in doing something that the camera doesn't move much it, it's like a straight line right the camera goes straight i mean things happen but yeah. the camera is kind of unfazed and go straight to where it has to be, which is this uh, lady that's trying to escape. And and I found we found that that straight line at certain point of the uh, of the day at certain time the sun was there, right? So it gave us this beautiful beginning with this huge house. This is a real slave plantation. The the wow. cabins we used. Where in the real cabins because you are not allowed to use that sure. for real. It's it's a it's a it's a memorial. It's really right. when you get into right. these cabins, it's like it's a feeling that's uh it's pretty heavy. Yeah. So we build these exactly replicas of those other cabins right on our path. And yeah, after you go through that facade facade of happiness, you start to see the real thing that's going on behind that thing, you know, which, which is the antebellum South, right. uh, that romanticism of, of that time, you know? And uh, yeah, at the beginning, it feels like, oh, look, oh, nature. And, you know, there are horses and, 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 and the directors who are so smart, they put geese and, and, and you know, yeah. peacocks. And, uh, and, uh, and then we go through that and then suddenly the military kind of takes you and then you start seeing these enslaved people working there and suddenly it gets grimmer and grimmer and grimmer until you hear the screams of this lady. And when you get there, she has a, a, a freedom path. The sun is in the background there. Right. Waiting for her, but it's a waning sun, right? It's going away. And, uh, and well, she decides to go on that. And that's, and, and that's, then it's like, well, things happen. But, um, but it, was, it was tough. We were lucky. But also we worked hard because we did four every day. We were attempting to do that shot at the end of the day, right? Yeah. And it's like okay, and we try again. And it was a movie, right? A movie held by two people. The movie thing the, with um, with an Alexa Mini, and we were using these these lenses, which are very particular, which are uh, the lenses used for Gone with the Wind. 
Okay. Like um, the real lenses, the rehouses by Panavision, right? Oh, wow. And that's okay. all those flares and that kind of weird thing is it's coming from this, this glass. And there are a couple of tricks. We go, you go through uh, some uh, like hedge, uh, how do you say hedge, like like fence or bushes. Right. The camera goes through and those are the effects because we needed to actually have a path for the camera. And there are another, but there, it was a lot of, of work of coordination, you know? Yeah. And, and Janelle, the actress had to be, had to actually be, way, we had a, a stunt double going on a horse and then we had to do a cowboy switch and put Janelle in a very specific position because the camera then turns to her. That's in the in the in the camera path, which is a, like a straight long line. There's one turn, which is to see J Janelle's face. Camera goes goes goes. So you see, you follow someone on a horse. Someone is slumping on a horse, and then that disappears. And then you when well, you pick out again, it's her. And then the soldiers come, and then all that madness happens later. But it was it was it was great. I'm very proud of that one. No, it was a really beautiful shot. And was that all? How much of that was practical lighting, and how much Everything. did you have to add? Everything. Okay, good. That's what I was wondering. I there felt was, like, yeah. as I was watching the movie, was it a lot of practical lighting? I, in the in the in this movie in particular, I I wanted to do as much practical lighting as I could. Um, there are there are some you know like. Asteras, you know, these uh, little tube, little, uh, the LED tubes that you can uh, program with your phone. There are some lights. And also, and also there are crazy, there, there is some crazy stuff. Um, but for the practical lights, the fire and the flame mm -hmm. bars and the candles, uh, we were doing it practical. And, um, and I wanted to, I wanted just to use the, the, the nice lenses. So I ended up mixing anamorphic and spheric and sphericals so at night weirdly it's mostly anamorphic uh with the high super high speed anamorphics from panavision that i think there are like 1.8 1.4 they're pretty fast uh lenses which are completely weird and super uh with a lot of character we can say <laughs> you know there's like aberrations all over the place right uh, and then we had a T1 lens, which was a Nikon lens uh, rehoused by Panavision. And that was used at night because I knew that I wanted to use fire uh, um, and little, little things. For that, uh, for, that for, the, for the night scenes, there's, uh, it's a funny story that uh, I wanted to, I started to search into painters as we all do, which I right. recommend, even though if it sounds snobby, and uh, sounds pretentious, we should always do, no matter the size of the project, you know, look at those classic painters. So I found, I found this Peter Van Broek. It's like a, a, a Belgian painter, right? I wanted to have a night that wasn't blue, right? Oh, okay. Or not that blue. You know, not your typical, you know, uh, bright blue night, but something a little bit less evident. So I, we found this guy uh, the, and uh, that guy used to have like a moon in all his paintings, right? And I was like, wow, that's, but that has the moon. The moon is great. Look at that moon. And we were always like, but look at that moon there. And, uh, and, that, and we ended up, I remember <laughs> we were driving. I, we, we drove by uh, a place that they were selling bouncy trampolines, right? And I went like, what if, what if we asked the Greeks to buy one of these trampolines? and put like full grid on it. And we have a moon, we hang it from a crane, we put a light behind <laughs> and we put it on a crane there. And, it, and, it was, and I was asking the gaffer, right? Chip Carey in, in New Orleans. I was like, Chip, do you think this is too crazy? And he was like, oh, I don't think so, let's go for it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, the, and the group were like, done, that's great. And they actually built one. They didn't buy the trampoline. They actually built one, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it was like a 15 foot diameter moon that we had on a crane. And, and so it was like, okay, let's put the moon over there. <laughs> and, the, and the moon will go like, Ooh. okay, a little bit higher. Okay, that's perfect. Leave the moon there. <laughs> and then that's it needed awesome. a lot of the effects. It was obviously, it was a little bit of a, a problem later because it looked rounded, but it didn't look like a moon, right? 
Uh, so they, they had to, you know, do some stuff to it. But it did lead those deep background stuff. And all the moons you see in the movie are is that thing, you know? And it's pretty That's believable. Crazy. I mean, yeah. That's crazy. I, I love that though. I, as a photographer and a lot of the audience is photographers, I know we are so used to just coming up with whatever we can come up with to make things work. <laughs> and it's strangely comforting to know that even on films with these budgets that most of us could never dream of, yeah, you're still like figuring stuff out and yeah. let's just hang that up there and light it and <laughs> yeah. use it to yeah, be our moon. Was, that- that was super that was that was kind of crazy i didn't know we could pull that up but yeah but it worked and also the the rest of the 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 rest of the scenes are lit with so little lights that you wouldn't believe it i think we had the gaffer came up with this crate box uh like normal size crate uh with a bunch of of christmas lights around and we will hang that thing from the trees to give a little bit of feel, you know? Yeah. It worked. It worked perfectly. And then the rest was a lot of torches, a lot of candles, right. and a lot of fire in general. Yeah, I noticed that. I remember seeing a lot of the close-ups and thinking the light was so beautiful. And I was trying to figure out as I was watching how much of it was practical and how much of it was added. I'm like, God, this really looks just natural, like so natural. I have to know. So yeah. I'm actually really glad to know that because I, I think um, for photographers, there's always this feeling of like, if we're not adding or using the coolest lights then it's not going to be a really fantastic shot Um, when the truth is really the light that gives you the feel that you want whether it's added or practical is really the right way to go yeah there's a there's a thin line there because while you took it i think uh it's it's also you know the how expressive is the picture right because you have to say something with the picture but also at the same time there's some kind of romantic side to it that you have to romanticize something because it's it's okay because it's kind of the the uh, however your mind uh, thinks about things you you want to have some some kind of heightened uh, feeling to it right um, some uh, so sometimes we tend to make things beautiful right uh, which may not be the right solution for everything but also at the same time let's not forget the power of beautiful beautiful it's a good thing you know it's uh beauty it's something that's uh relatable in a way i think uh uh, uh you see beauty and you have that weird <laughs> warm feel i don't know obviously everyone's taste it's different uh but a, a good composition with balanced lighting and and, and 3d feel always kind of work in a way Obviously, in the expression of the of a movie where you're expressing a, a, a story, beautiful is not always the answer. Sometimes it's right. ugly or sometimes it's uh, upsetting or sometimes it's something else. But uh, but but still there is a thing of you know trying to use the tools to create that vision that you are uh, uh, y- 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 you're, you 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 have in your mind, but sometimes they are not needed, you know? It's, they are just tools, right? And every tool has its, it's like, you cannot use, you know, a, a Phillips star screwdriver to unscrew a flat uh, head screwdriver. And and that's kind of it, you know? I mean, you can use a knife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. But, that's but actually that a really, really good point. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know, it's fun. Yes, yes, agreed. So, um, which leads me into a whole bunch of other questions I wanted to ask. But first, as you were describing kind of setting up this shot and I'm remembering watching it, do you think that that shot set the tone for the rest of the movie? Because I definitely feel like, I don't know if you know this story, during the filming of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and Gene Wilder said, I want to fall in the beginning. He wanted to come out with this limp and then jump up and be like, oh, look, no limb for me. And his point was, I need to set the tone for the fact that you will never believe anything Willy Wonka does. Like you'll never know, do I believe him or do I not believe him? Is he fooling, is he not fooling? That's brilliant. Yeah, I thought so too. And that just reminded me of this beginning shot where 
we see this contrast and we have this setup for like things are going to get dark and things are going to get dark and you know um do you feel when you were setting that up were you thinking of that in terms of like setting the tone for the rest of the film or how did you come up with that shot in I the first place i don't know if uh, we were um I don't know if we were thinking exactly on that, right? Uh, I think it's it's a very intuitive work what we do, and sometimes we make decisions that that it, they are difficult to consciously explain, right? Because <clears throat> the, the medium it's, it's it explains itself, right? You, you don't explain a movie; you just watch it, or you don't. Ex right. It's like trying to explain a, a color to a blind person. It's it's difficult, you know. Yeah, yeah. it's warm. I don't know. But um, but uh, there was a, a clear intention of connecting those two ends, right? The beautiful end with the horrifying end. There mm. was a, a also the music is fantastic and the music yes. adds to that tension. But I don't know. But the music came later. But but at the same time, it's a, it's like a synergic thing that fits of itself, right? But um, there wasn't that. Uh, there wasn't. Uh, uh, at least consciously the feeling of okay let's let's make this the most ominous thing that we can think of right there was a, 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 a the will of connecting those ends and make them uh, live in the same space without cutting right okay this is the uh, one thing and also the 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 idea of connecting those spaces especially you know this is not that far away from from each other right the 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 lady of the house and the lady that wants to escape right uh it's it's also like it's like it's kind of these are two faces you know and they, they are they live together um but you're right i think in in the end the 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 it's like the, the willy wonka thing is like saving the cat you know that theory of that the hero has to save the cat in the first movie so then you like him for the rest of the movie right. it, it is it is a little bit of that uh, in a cinematography um, uh, sense that that it's kind of a slippery slope the movie has a little bit of a uh, i don't know it ends well or something like that maybe uh but uh but yes it is a slope yes uh, um it's pretty it's well, it has that twist. Also. I don't know. I don't want to spoil it. All right. <laughs> and I try not to give too much away. Um, I really love that you mentioned that there's that element to it that is instinctual because as a, um, I'm also a writer. And so there are times where I'll be writing a novel and I'll get to the end and realize I've included these things in the beginning that I was not thinking of at the time that end up tying everything together at the end. And I don't know if that's from our kind of collective psyche of the history of storytelling that it's just kind of built in there. Um, but I love that you brought that up because I, I do think as creators, um, that's something inherent that's in here. You kind of know how you want to tell a story and sometimes your instinct proves that it's really deep rooted. Yeah, well, I feel like sometimes uh, you have to charge instinct right and how you charge instinct you charge instinct by feeling it with all the things that you think that may be correct for whatever you're doing in your case i'm sure you were thinking of your story 24 7 right right i think sometimes i met uh, uh, many writers that are like when they're thinking of something they kind of disconnect they are always thinking about that everything that happens i mean they may be talking to you but then in the end in the in the back of their heads there's a little machine moving years about that story, <laughs> right? And I'm sure all that gets saved on that memory. And then when you are connected to your medium, which is writing or, or, or photography, uh, that comes out. But also I, I, I believe that you can charge it. You know, you can uh, like add things that are gonna appear later. Uh, and it's more, also, I mean, it's hard to listen to your in instincts because I, I I consider myself a very rational person, but but and and for a rational person, you always need some kind of justification for your acts, right? Why I'm doing this and why I'm asking for that or why I feel like 
and and sometimes there's no enough computing power to 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 explain a decision, right? And um, and uh, and I, I I tend to believe that that's coming from your instinct, but also I I I learned to listen to my instinct and say, okay, it sounds a little bit hippie, right? And I'm trying I I, I try not to be like that, but I I am so. Uh, it sounds like, okay, you know, Pedro, you know what's best. You may be wrong, but uh, in, in, in the case when you uh, are deciding something, you have, to, you have to make a decision, right? Because you are the cinematographer, the writer, the director, whatever you're doing right. in life. And at one point you have to take a decision and say, okay, this is what we should do. And I, t I try to stop and say, okay, okay, your body knows, you know, you know, if there's something that's wrong, there's something that's wrong. Maybe you can't explain, or if there's something that rings a bell of, of <laughs> sparks joy, you know, it's, it kind of sparks joy and you should, you should listen to it. Sometimes it's difficult because at the same time, that, that, that decision or that, or that action that you take is kind of driven by, 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 by the ego, which is, a good thing and a bad thing at the same time, because you, you have to always be, or at least how, how I think it's, I, I'm always kind of checking on my ego. It's okay, it's my ego getting in the middle of this thing, you know, and, and messing with this thing is something that makes me feel whatever, vulnerable or, or, or less than someone else or less macho or less intelligent or less whatever. And I try to say, okay, no, let's try not to, you know, that ego mess with whatever we are doing. Let's make the best for the movie. But at the same time, at one point, you need to be confident enough to say, oh, no, you know what, guys, what we're doing is this. We're going to hang that 18 from that building on the 18th floor <laughs> out of that window. And they're going to go like, no, that's going to take five hours of reading. And I said, <laughs> we need it. Yeah. yeah. And at that point, it's tough. It's tough. But if uh, also at the same time, it's it's OK. Well, that's what we do. If it if you put that light there and doesn't work, you go like, you know, that light, it's great. Let's kill it. <laughs> <laughs> like, nice work. Don't need it anymore. Well Take it down. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, but yeah. So uh, so I think it's it's yeah, you can you can recharge your instincts with uh, the proper uh, materials. What I do is I research. I go to shot deck or film grab and uh, and start looking for movies that maybe similar to the one I'm doing or or I liked at one point for something particular. I start going through the frames and I save those frames, put them in a put them in a big um, work uh, uh, space or put them or print them. You know go to CBS and print them in, in photo paper and um, and then have them have them around and and, and it, that that stays in you know it stays in and also the, the other thing that I, I just I wrapped uh, yesterday don't breathe too right oh okay we, we shot the second one wow and it was super fun it was super good and we we wrapped yesterday i am in i am in detroit right now in a hotel in detroit and um and uh every time i would watch a movie during production at the next day i would come with something i was like wait 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 what, what were you watching <laughs> you know like yeah good fellas and suddenly we were well, just <laughs> steady cam starts outside of the bar there's no bar in this scene <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Dang right, it. Let's, uh, well, let's do something else. <laughs> do you find that there's a way? So I 100% agree with you on this idea of kind of like charging or priming the pump or kind of getting yourself ready to live in that headspace. Do you ever find that it starts to contaminate your vision or, or how do you stop other people's visions from kind of coming in and taking over yeah. how you would be it, making something it's, it's it's what i call the 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 popular movement of making movies uh syndrome <laughs> because <laughs> I, what, what what i what i tell everyone and i really believe this is when i when i when i'm meeting you know the camera assistant uh the gaffer the grip uh obviously the director and 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 for sure but i tell them uh you tell me everything you see 
you tell me. If you have an idea, tell me. If 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 you go like at the camera operator, if you go like, I think we should do this. Tell me, you know. Don't 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 save anything. In a way, because I can steal those ideas, but but also uh, also because I know that they know, you know, they these people, the, the crew have done hundreds of movies, right? They usually like movies. They like what they do, uh, and uh, and maybe those ideas, maybe they are not the the correct thing for the movie because you always have to kind of keep that macro vision of what's the movie for you, but maybe they spark something else, right? And uh, and and ideas they come and go. You kind of cling too strongly to an idea. Yeah, one thing came and you grabbed it and it was great. And uh, and went away, and then you have to create another one. <laughs> it's like, and that's a ne never-ending process. So you better start training that muscle, you know, of creating new shit. Because if not, you, you know, if you have uh, not many tricks, you know, you can you're not gonna last long. Um. So so I tell them, but I know, I know that in the end it's my responsibility, right? And uh, and that's when kind of that that instinctual uh, thing comes along because I, I tell them to the crew, do you tell me whatever you tell me whatever you see, but don't expect me to 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 listen that much to you. I may go like, yeah, that's perfect. Or I may go like, no, that's bullshit. Or I may go like, mm, let me think about that one. That one, that one sounds good. Uh, I'm I'm also a little bit uh, flexible on set. I'm not very um uh I, I plan a lot, mostly in prep, to know what what's my what's how's the field, right? Just to know the battlefield. Like if I'm if I'm building a set, I grab the plans and I bring mock-ups of techno cranes and I have my scale meters and I know every angle that where where we can put the camera to see this and that. But then when I when I'm there on the set, I'm a little bit more uh, chaotic. But we make our days. <laughs> <laughs> we make our days perfectly and it, it usually looks good uh but um but i think you have to always kind of keep that line that kind of instinctual line of what you think is good for the movie and try to learn how to listen to yourself you know without right. being an asshole uh, <laughs> that's a good, which is good very important because <laughs> you're working yeah, with the team asshole, yeah gonna share any ideas with you <laughs> True. So do you think that there's something in um, deciding which things to take and which things to discard that that is where your taste comes into play? Like, um, because obviously it's one thing if we're copying something shot for shot, right? Like that's taking somebody else's thing. But if you're taking bits and pieces from everywhere, then it's part of your vision that decides, well, this piece works or this piece doesn't. And maybe even if you're heavily influenced, what you decide to keep and what you decide to throw away ultimately comes down to who you are as an artist. Yeah, I mean, Tarantino uh, grabs scenes from every movie he likes and recreates them. And nobody's gonna say like, hey, Tarantino, you're a, you're a thief. Because, right. the, because, I mean, and this is something my dad always says, uh, when you copy something, right? Let's say you want to copy the Mona Lisa. You know, <laughs> it's not easy, right? <laughs> to copy the Mona right. Lisa, and mostly, mostly, mo most sure, it's not going to be like the Mona Lisa. It's going to be something else. Yeah, maybe your appropriation of the Mona Lisa, or your interpretation of the Mona Lisa, or whatever. But most, mostly, sure, it's not going to be exactly the same unless you're a very a professional uh, uh, painter that does that for life. But uh, right. uh, but so my dad always said, like, you know what? Copy, copy stuff. If you see something you like, go copy it. And uh, by copying, you kind of do the, the same process that that guy did, or, you know, uh, obviously a little bit faster, maybe not as, as thorough that he, he went through, right? But maybe you catch little things of that technique or that uh special that like that kind of lighting or you saw you know that uh, or that thing and that ends up being and it ends up having a new signification it ends 
ends up being new because you know the weather was different that day or or whatever you know you didn't have that say you did you weren't shooting in um uh, kodak exr 100 uh daylight films right. you were we were using a red or an alexa or a 5d or whatever and um but but i think you know if you if you if you care and if you love it enough and you and you are thorough with you, what you do you probably have a new thing there even though that you were copying but at the end, you you finish. You, you don't copy anymore. You just you. Right. That's such a good point. Um, some of our our audience today, Kelly Robotai, who is a photographer and digital artist in Canada, she says that she's actually writing about this for her presentation next week about how taking inspirations from other people's work and then twisting it to make it your own thing, um, which I think. It seems like in the beginning, when you're first learning, that's when you are kind of copying without really understanding how you can take those things. But hopefully through the journey, by the end, you're taking them and going, okay, I can make this work for what I want rather than I just want to make what those people are making. Yeah, um, I think, you know what, sometimes, mostly I see it in, in commercials, right? Some that we we copy a lot i mean I, I don't work in many commercials lately i would like to do more because it takes less time than a movie you know this sure. this movie i just wrapped <laughs> took me like five months you know right. and but um but i think i think that there's there's some something of value on mindless copying anyway you have to know that you are copying you know you can, it cannot be something that that oh yeah this is this is what uh, i'm an artist this is what i do and you are copying right you gonna you, you, you gonna be be true to yourself and say yeah 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 i'm trying to look like that and because when i i remember when when i did this was my my second movie yeah my second movie this horror film that was a sec uh, a single shot horror film right uh we were shooting a commercial with this director and it was like a crappy commercial from for a chocolate thing in uruguay right three million people country in south america uh uh we are like looking at this chocolate <laughs> turn around and we're like oh man we need to make a movie man it's like what the fuck are we doing <laughs> and uh, it was good anyway and um and uh, suddenly a friend of mine, a producer came, came back from England. He was in a, on a festival and he said like, listen, I met this producer, probably a pirate producer, but I made this producer and he said, nobody cares about those routine movies, uh, those movies about normal life in Uruguay. Now, if you give me, if you get me a horror film, you know, horror is kind of universal. I'm sure we could sell that one. And the guy came came back to Uruguay and said, like, hey guys, we need to do a horror film. Look. And we're like, all right, let's let's do a horror film. And uh, this this director who's brilliant, this a Uruguayan director, he he works over there. He came up with an idea. And um we before HD, before HD, uh there was a world, and uh, <laughs> we were thinking all the time of getting. 10 cans of 16 millimeters film, right? And shoot a movie in 10 days with 10 shots, right? Wow. 10, ten nine minute shots. You know, we left two minutes of, of for, for maybe if it's a false start there. Uh, and we said, like, yeah, we're going to do that movie. And, and, and this guy said, okay, let's do a horror film with this new camera that your friend has, 5D. Uh, and we just do a single, single shot, you know. We shoot it, and we shot it in four days. This, this wow. thing, and it went to Cannes, and it got remade in the U.S. But, uh, but for that movie, as a DP, it was a big challenge. But also, I wanted to be general. I wanted to be. I wanted to look like a horror film. And uh, and I had to copy, you know what? And I went like, okay, what we what we need, you know. And it was kind of, uh, of you know, uh, uh, let's do a horror film. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do my art. I'm going right. to do myself through the pictures. No, no, no. It was like, uh, let's make it look like those Hollywood movies. Yeah. And it, 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 even though it was a little bit mindless, 
it worked and eventually right. paved the paved the road for something else you know it, it no, does, that's... nothing nothing comes uh, like that right no that's such a good point um and and actually brings me to another one of the questions i wanted to ask but there's definitely these visual markers, I think, that cue people into what to expect from something and how they should feel about something. Um, and yeah, you don't you really come up with those on your own. That's that's kind of part of our, our general visual understanding of the world. Like we know kind of what horror films look like and we know kind of what action films look like. And um, there's definitely something too. okay, let's make it look this way because then people know what they're getting from us and they know how to feel about it. Yeah. And, so that makes a lot of sense, um, which actually leads me to one of the questions I wanted to ask. So when you're making some of the creative decisions about how you want a film to look, like I noticed, you know, the, the color palette in this film, really earthy tones, very subdued. Um, how do you go about making those decisions? Are you kind of relying on some of these industry standard, like if we're going to do a Western, it's going to be a little washed out and it's going to, you know, or if we're going to do it, we're going to have lots of saturated colors. Like, is it some of that? Um, how do you go about making those decisions? Well, I always, I always try to break it, right? To, to go, try to go a different way, do something else. But at the same time, it's a tough thing because I know that we are working in a certain uh, uh, um, um, space that kind of gives you that. Uh, in the case of, of this horror film we, we shot, I was very specific about, oh, okay, let's look horror film. It was an abandoned house, very dark. And uh, there was this girl on a tank top and, uh, you know, and this uh, kind of uh, monster uh, uh, other, other people and that kind of takes you to a place without even you i mean uh it kind of made no sense to make that bright right right i mean there's no mystery there's no something lurking in the shadows it's a horror film you know you need to be a little bit afraid or scared um in the case of antebellum like the, the jumping you know uh, uh, uh to 12 years after um there is some of those visual uh, cues for the genre for the period right right uh like like you cannot ex escape to 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 costume design you can't escape right. to, to for the production design it gives you something that's already there it's it will it, it kind of it will be diff not i don't know if, i mean maybe it would be a really nice exercise to do but you know having uh, having the 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 world of being super colorful would be a little bit weird. It gets colorful in Antebellum, right? But not in the period part, and um, and and that kind of leads you to some places that may be cliche or common or or stereotype, right? At the same time, I'm not scared of cliches and I'm not scared of stereotypes because when you're telling a story, you know, as a writer you need to use those symbols that represent certain things to be clear about that story, right? But I always try anyway to break it uh, in some way, at some point you may find there are some scenes that are like, this is a little bit different to what I'm used to, right? And right. at least in my work, right? Uh, look, this has a different uh, thing. At the same time, I think the story leads you. Story right. leads, you know, uh, when we did, when we shot The Girl in the Spider's Web, it was about this hacker in Sweden, which is very, very uh, grand. Everything is kind of grand. And also it's very precise and very uh, hard and very sterile in a way. We shot it with an Alexa 65 with, you know, prime 65 lenses. It's like, uh but this other movie, you know, uh, for Antebellum, I wanted to have something else super organic and kind of noisy and, and, and grainy. So I ended right. up forcing the Alexa to 1600 16, ISO and uh, using these very old lenses. Also, I wanted to do something that I never did before that was deep focus to have everything sharp. 
And uh, and I called the guys at Panavision and I spoke with, with Dan Sasaki. He helped me. Uh, um, that I told him like, hey, I need to do deep focus, but I don't want any lens that's resembling to anything modern because once you go past T8 or T11, everything looks so sharp in digital that it's not nice. Right. And I'm, and I'm like, we are like, uh, I don't know, I need very old lenses than like, like the lenses we used for going, for going with the wind. And he was like, oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we have them here. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, 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 they're here. There's some shelf there. Um, there are two sets in the world. One is at Panavision and the other one uh, Paul Thomas Anderson has. And uh, that's what they told me, right? And, um, and, uh, and I ended up bringing those lenses, which all the way stop down didn't look that sharp. They're sharp and kind of sharp anyway. Uh, and, and that was because of the story. I wanted to have deep focus because I knew that we are in a cotton field and I wanted to have a person here and a person here and that window over there, having someone there and having like a, like 300 yards away, another guy working the land to kind of let the audience see, you know, what's around and not because with the, with selective focus, it's very easy to tell them what to look at, right? You won't right. look anything that's blurred. You just go to whatever is sharp. It's a little bit pushy, right? That selective focus, yeah. like you're you're kind of controlling everybody. That yeah, way. you're gonna look at that eye, not this right. eye, that eye. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really great point. But I think um, it's it's kind of driven by the story, because cinematography, at least how I see it, it needs to help the story develop. And if it goes, I mean, no cinematography ever saved a movie, right? Um, uh, if the story it, was it, bad. Exactly. Right. It, but it helps. It helps. And if the story is good, it can amplify greatly, you know, the thing. Right. And, um, I, but I think they have to go together, you know, and kind of, they kind of go two separated paths because it becomes, I don't know, though, I'm very flexible. I mean, maybe there's, maybe, maybe the next movie I'll, I'll, I'll face it like, okay, let's do, whatever we're gonna go against everything in this one <laughs> <laughs> so that actually more. that brings up a, a really interesting question which i i did actually have written down and i'm sure a lot of people will be curious about where does and i i know that there are some directors who work very very closely with their cinematographers and it's really collaborative i know that there's some directors who are very very specific on what they want and then the cinematographer just carries that out how does that work for you specifically with antebellum um but do you find that in films you have a lot of control or do you find that it's much more collaborative um i like collaboration per per for, for starters, right? I mean, it's like, okay, this is a collaborative art. We are, it's a big team. We spend a lot of time together and uh, we need to collaborate to make this happen. But in the, in the particular case of Antebellum, uh, the two directors uh, were uh, these guys that didn't have any experience on making a movie, right? They didn't know anything about making a movie, but they are brilliant people that have great ideas and really courageous people, people that go forward with what they want, right? And I love that. When I see that in a person, I really like it. When someone fights for what they want, for real, with smart, right? Not, 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 not just fighting for fighting. Um, uh, but they didn't have uh, much experience doing this kind of stuff. So I had to take a lot of control on the movie. And, and, and I told you, I had this um, uh, uh, assistant director, uh, that uh, that he was brilliant. He's brilliant, and he helped us to make the movie a lot. You know, he was one of those assistant directors that said, "Like, I, uh, Pedro, if you don't like the light, we should stop. We shouldn't shoot it. We just wait because it, it's pointless to. I mean, look at all these uh, um, resources. We're gonna we're gonna do something wrong. You know, an idea that tells you that." And also he understood exactly what, what we were talking about when we were talking about doing deep focus. And he gave us those big plateaus with a lot of upstage and downstage, you know? Um, but it was basically him and me that 
took the 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 load of the specific technical movie making stuff and it was my job to translate these guys ideas into something that you could see on the screen they had a lot of ideas about uh about uh shots uh, 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 a lot of shots that they, they they saw them and it was a matter of like, okay, let me, give me your head. Okay, okay, we're gonna put this onto the camera <laughs> and it worked beautiful. Um, but in this particular case, I had a lot of control uh, on, on what we were doing. I told them obviously, because I, I want them to, I want to make their vision a reality and not, my, not pursue my own agenda. Um, but uh, and, and they were and they were they were okay with it, you know. And, and I showed them pictures of what I thought it was correct, and they and they loved it. And um, uh, we spoke about that long uh, shot at the beginning, how to connect those those two worlds, and um, and uh, it was very collaborative. But on on the ideas level, on the at, at one point we had a lot of discussions. Also, I love these guys, and we ended up. Uh, being really good friends, um, but we have a, we had a lot of discussions. At, at one point, I had to tell them. I had to tell them, like, listen, I cannot tell you everything I'm, I'm gonna do because we simply don't have time for that. You have to. This is a a, a a trust position you're putting me. You have to trust. You will have to trust in me. <laughs> and, it, and they were like, okay, <laughs> uh, but it worked. They love it, and they and they and they. It, I think it worked for the movie, which is for me the most important thing, right? Sure. To make it work and make it make you enjoy the movie. And also, these are these are people, these two directors, um, uh, that they really appreciate art, and they're very intelligent people that love all uh, all of um, the art. So they like beautiful too, right? Even so, and and it was like okay, I think there's something about the clash of beautiful and horrifying here you know right uh because there is you know you see uh, there's something and i think it talks speaks about the, the the clash that we have with all these things you know about how it's a weird translation but something something has to do with it about that clash you know this horrifying thing happening in this beautiful world uh, um I think in some level you understand that, you know. Right. No, I I agree. I mean, there were scenes that were absolutely stunningly shot and beautifully lit, like with the the tent scene with all the candles and there's this atmosphere in the air. And you know, the photographer side of me is like, oh, like getting really excited about the possibilities of what you can shoot in there. And then the part of me that's watching the film is just going through that period of kind of disgust and like revulsion at what's happening in this scene and it definitely I think it increases that the tension but also the the sense of disconnect like this should not be a thing right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. totally totally it's there's a there's a clash there and, and I think one of the one of the the the, the ideas of the movie or one of the things that the movie wants to do or the directors want to do, uh, Chris and, and Gerard, is to, to, to clash a little bit, you know, to right. make, to, to start talking about stuff, even, though, you know, and, and, and to be, you know, to talk about it. Sometimes I feel like, like, like we need to talk more, that's it, you know, we need to, yeah. even though, even though that, that talk itself may not yield results immediately, it will eventually. You know, sometimes it happens to me when I talk with someone and we all have our, our ideas and we are like, and suddenly, well, then you go home and when you have a little bit of uh, time for you, if you can find time for you, which is also something I, I think we're missing a little bit, um, then you thought, they think about it and it's like, yeah, maybe, right? <laughs> and, and that's yeah. it, that's good enough. Yeah, no, sometimes just planting the seeds and, and letting those grow at some point is no. the most important thing. Um, so for the kind of, when does your job actually start? Like, 
Are you coming in during storyboarding process to talk with the director about how to kind of, you know, what camera movements can work for their vision? Or are you coming in at a later time? You know, how, how does that work? Usually it depends on the director, right? But usually I start like, let's say if we have two, three months of shooting, we should have like two and a half months of prepping or something. Right. Like that. So sometimes the directors, obviously they start before because they start with the script, with the studio, with the, but then when we move to a, to an office to do hard prep, I'm there from the beginning. And, um, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, I draw, I drew, I draw a lot. So for me, it's easy to communicate with drawings, right? Uh, which sometimes are faster than words and say like, oh, the camera is low here against the thing blah, 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 blah. with a little drawing. You, okay, it's this. Ah, okay, perfect, yeah. Um, and, uh, and I get really involved. It depends on the director. Uh, obviously, there are some directors are more clear about what they want. Some, they love the camera, some they hate the camera and, um, mm. and they like the actors and, and you know, and, um, and it's, uh, it's when you build a crew, also you build a crew depending on, you know, who, who this, this director is, because maybe, you need a stronger camera operator or maybe a camera operator that that's more like a technical guy that needs to be told exactly what to do or you need a very creative one to help with some of the stuff and uh, and so and so with all the the positions that you end up filling right for a movie and so it, it has a little bit of um, kind of managerial uh, side and but at the same time and constantly feeling them with pictures and uh, camera movements or and we talk about I mean this is very cliche and everyone says it but I think it's it's it, it's important anyway we talk about music about movies about books about everything that may be charging that intuition that we're going to need because then when you jump into the shoot you're like a soldier and you need to you need to to get your training and say like okay soldier right. what now now we uh, put the camera there and uh, you know it's like you have to react and uh, there's no time for 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 hesitating too much there's some time but uh, not too much right you need to make those hours effective this is a very expensive medium uh, sure. and we have you know so many things involved and uh, the logistics are are, are mind boggling you know it's so but but at the same time yeah i mean i don't know I, I, I trust the, the, the crew, right, in that sense of the ADs or the, pro, the producers. But I try to get, as soon as I can, uh, try to draw as, more, as, more as, as much as we can. But at the same time, I know that usually we throw the story wars before starting the day. We go like... <laughs> and then we get to shoot. <laughs> because everything changes, you know. And, right. and, and the actors are very important part of piece of that thing and uh, and I like them to have room and uh, and after it's it's not until you block the scene that you know exactly or almost exactly how you want to shoot it right it's good if you can do if you can go go the extra step and go to the location a day before and take 20 half hour uh, or one hour on that set to think about it because usually when you think better, better stuff comes up. The right. more you put your mind on, into something, the better results you will get. You will get. It's like it's a matter of quantity. You know, it's put as many hours as you can. Obviously, we all need time off and we all need to rest. That's for sure. Nobody works well exhausted. But um, but the the more you can do, the better. And uh, I, I really believe in prep. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I do have just kind of two final questions as we're coming to the end of this hour. Um, and I, I, one that I always ask everybody, so I, I'll set that aside. But um, so for gear, I know um, a lot of people are really interested in, you know, personally, my my. My focus is always on vision because I feel like the vision comes first and the gear serves it. Um, but is there any particular lenses or cameras that you find yourself coming back to often that you feel like serve your vision or fit your creative style yeah. more than others? Well, um, the, the gear 
it's an important part of this. We, we it's uh, this is kind of this craft. Sometimes the gear is the language, right? The 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 method is the language. You cannot. It's like if you want to make an oil painting, you cannot use watercolors. Right. You have to use oil. So when you decide that you're gonna use a techno crane, it's gonna be one of those techno crane kind of movies, you know, <laughs> because there's right. so much stuff that you can do. Uh, but uh, or if you decide not to have a techno crane, you know that you're gonna have certain style to the camera work or to it. Let's say, okay, let's do it from the dolly. Let's do all dolly moves or not. Let's do it from sticks. And it's going to be, we have to find that really good shot that entertains you for 25 seconds or one minute or 10 minutes or whatever. So I think the gear, it's part of the vision in a way, right? Not entirely because I remember when we shot this, this movie, the horror film, the single shot horror film, we did that with a 5D because it was what we had. And it doesn't matter which camera where we used. We could have used another camera. The thing that was an idea there and it, the camera served its purpose. Um, but I end up using Alexa all the time, Alexa Mini. Lately, I'm trying to push it a little up more and more and more and more. I'm like in 1600 ISO and 2000 ISO. Uh, 2000, I don't remember, the, 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 yeah, 2000, then 25, 80, I don't remember. But um, usually Alexa, usually lately anamorphic. This last movie we shot with the Hawk anamorphics, I, I feel like anamorphic has something there. I know my mom doesn't see it. <laughs> um, <laughs> he give, he, she loves movies, but she doesn't see anamorphic. Um, there's something there that I feel like attracted to. I, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but Don't Breathe One, the, the other one, we showed it with the Lake Astumi Luxes. And what I wanted to have is I wanted to have a lens that was dependable, that was a workhorse, that I had a lot of, a, lo a range of, of a lot of focal distances because I know that the director of that one, Fede, loves the camera and he wants to have the most, the more flexibility you can give him the better. So I said like, okay, let's have something that's dependable, that works always the same, that I can go from here to over there without having to, you know, change a diopter. And, um, but at the same time, I felt like the, the contrast between what's sharp and what's blurry was interesting. So we used them usually wide open, which was a little bit of a nightmare, but it ended up working well. Um, so I think, on the lens, on the camera, I will go Alexa all the time, but on the lens, I, I, I change. Sometimes it's, I shot a movie, this movie in Canada that's called Look Away about a, a very perfect family in Northern New York. And I did, we used master anamorphics, you know, the probably the most perfect lens that you can find. Yeah? Perfection, it's a weird thing. It's not always good. And, um, but then the girl in the spiders where we used this six, Alexa 65 with these very nice lenses. But then, you know, this one, Don't Breathe Too, which was more organic, more earthy, antebellum, the same, more human, more close, more, um, I think it's a, a, it's a tool, you know? And if you have right. the, 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 if you're lucky enough to, to, to have a, cho uh, a choice, you have to experiment as much as you can. The, the best guy that does that is this guy, Dan Sasaki at Panavision. He's kind of a guru and he's like, he listens to you, to what you want for the movie. He, he asks you questions that you can ask yourself. You know, what do I want? What do I have? How's, how are the locations? Do I have tall ceilings or low ceilings? Do I have, I'm going to put overhead lights or not, or it's going to be a practice. And you start kind of, sewing all those stuff together and when you pull it together he you find the lens if not my my if you cannot choose use whatever you have try to make it try to make it expressive try to say something but use whatever you have whatever you have. whatever you have now it's better one to what we had when we were kids <laughs> an iphone is, is a thousand times 
better to what we had. You know, I used to make this. I was lucky I have this friend that had a camera. We we used to do like stop motion with a with a high eight video camera. <laughs> it was crap, like wreck stop. You know. <laughs> no, I think that that's such good advice, and I'm glad that that's kind of one of the ending points of this conversation is this gear is everything and nothing, right? It's, it's everything and it's nothing. It's, it's so important to help you tell the story. And yet you can still tell the story if you can think creatively and, and make those adjustments. Um, and I think that there's some real value in starting from a place of, you know, maybe you're starting with a 5D and you don't have a huge budget for all this great stuff and you have to think your way around it. And then by the time you get these fantastic cameras and lenses in your hand, you've kind of gone through the boot camp of like, I know how to think my way through these problems. So now that I have this great stuff, I can yeah. use it to the fullest extent of yeah. its abilities. Yeah, in a way it's secondary for the for the purposes of the storytelling, right? But you need to know the limitations and the, and the, and the, and the advantages of your gear. Um, when you have that 5D, talking that specifically about that, and you are shooting and you're handheld, you know, it, you see the whole like jelly effect and it sucks. You know, what, what should I do? Well, put it on the stand, you know? Uh, you don't have stand, you know, get a pile of books and, and put it there. <laughs> right. But do something because that sucks. And that's that kind of, it's, the, it's like, I don't know who said that, 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 that the lack of limitations is, is the enemy of, of, of art. Because it's, 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 it's like that, you know, when you can do whatever you want, you don't think about it. But when you have a wall or a 5D um, and, 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 uh, and you kind of go through the wall or you kind of have that fancy whatever color um, space the Alexa has, well, you have to work around it. Maybe you shoot black and white. Maybe you, you know, you shoot everything with the same lens and create a new, I don't know, whatever. But you have to think about what's your story. Think about the bones of your story you're telling and, and try to get to the get to the core of it and say like, okay, how do I translate that into my thing with the camera or or whatever, whatever I have. I know I the, the 5D, yeah, it sucks. But at the same time, it's like this. You can put it wherever. You can put it under this table. And right. You don't need to lift the the. I we you know when you try to cram uh, you know a big camera in a place, you end up lifting the person on an app on a two apple boxes, and then you have to make a path for that person to walk on two apple boxes, which restrains the acting, and uh, it, it it's like it becomes a big circus. With a five D, you don't need that. You just put the camera. There. <laughs> Right, and um, so it it has its advantages and, and disadvantages. But I think you, if your focus is on the story, you'll be fine. I love that. Um, <laughs> as a storyteller in several genres, that is absolutely. I agree with you. That is my favorite. I think. <laughs> I think stories change the world. I think they change the way yeah. we think and the way we, you know, the way we understand each other and how we relate to each other and the world around us. So I 100% agree with you there. Um, before we get to the very last question, Bobby Thompson would like to know if there's a difference between the process of coming into shooting um, mid series, or like a mini series versus features like episodic versus, you know, a big feature film. How do you, how does that process differ? Yeah, there is, it, there is a difference. Um, I didn't shoot too much, too much television, but I did shoot uh, this show that's called Penny Dreadful City of Angels. Yes, I shot I shot um, four episodes, so I I, I delved in right. I, I was in there, and uh, the there was a fair fair good amount of prep for that show. It was kind of a big show, so I don't know if it's, I know I know I also I also shot the pilot for Swamp Thing. Uh, two 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 shows that were canceled, but. <laughs> I hope it wasn't because of the cinematography. I don't think so. Um, um, the difference, there, there are differences, mostly in time. On TV, you have Penny Dreadful had 14 days per episode, which was awesome. It was a lot. Uh, and the pilot for something had 14 days to also. But all the other episodes for something were 10 day episodes. Mm -hmm. And you have to shoot really fast. And so you have to build a system that's kind of foolproof and that you can know, you know that you can go fast 
and, and delivering consistent good results, right? Um, so it's, it's also about setting up a system. On a movie, Don't Breathe 2, we shot 52 days, you know? I mean, there were no idling days. We were running all the time. It was a bigger script also, you know? We had a lot of things going on. And, um, but the main difference is the time. Then I, I, I was surprised on the amount of, of money there was for these TV shows. I think there was more money for these TV shows than for the for this movie, um, and that's uh, that's good, obviously, right? Because the, the the crews were really good, and 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 um, and uh, we had everything we wanted. But um, but the storytelling itself always becomes a little bit lazy mm. because you have less time, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of the story is driven by the dialogue, right? So there's a lot of, okay, establisher, shot and reverse. It's tough. When I see TV that breaks with that, I kind of, my heart goes like, ah, look at that. Jeez. I mean, it's difficult to do, man. It's really difficult to do. Yeah. That would be great if um, audiences could understand those limitations a little bit because it's so easy to be like, oh, it didn't do the thing and yeah. I don't like how it was. It's like, man, these guys are doing the best they can. With yeah, they're they bringing have. their asses like, up. There's yeah, yeah. limitations there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And there, there's, there's some, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It's, it's really tough. I don't know, but um, but I like. I mean, there's so so much good television, but at this at the at the, at the same time, we always say with, when I, I I always try to have a set that has a good mood, right? That there's no screaming. We are like trying to have a good time. We spend a lot of hours together, and I I really care about the well-being of of everyone, right? And um and uh, I, I forgot where where I was going. Um, but yeah, no, I don't know. I, I totally lost myself, but I, <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to say that, I guess. I, I think that being, being, being good people in the, on the set, it's, it really matters. Yeah. You know? Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. That, I think that's one thing that I'm the proudest of and the feedback I get from the teams that I work with is that it was great to be on set. And that makes me happy because that means they're more likely to work with me again in the future, yeah. but that means that it was a good experience in addition to yeah. hopefully producing a good product. Exactly, it's, the work is it's hard enough to have a bad right. time there, you know? Agreed. We are Agreed. all working there. So Bobby, I hope that answered your question. We have already gone over our time. It's so hard to keep it condensed when it's such a great conversation. So first, sir, I will it's say thank good. you so much for being here with thank me today. You. Um, and then finally, so my final question before we jump off of YouTube is what is your why? Why creation as a job? Well, that's a big question. Um, yes. we, with, this, with this director, we did Don't Breathe, we are good friends. And we were talking a lot, of, a lot about that. Why, why, why is that? I don't really know exactly. I think that it's, it's, it's kind of a need. But at the same time, it's something that I, I feel comfortable with uh, uh, about you know being flexible with stuff. I think flexibility is key to be creative because it allows you to connect different weird weird things that may not be related or may not seem related at first. And um, and I think it's some kind of uh, the drive. Why the drive? It's addictive also because when you are like when you are like shooting, and now that I just wrap this movie i know tomorrow and the days after i'm gonna be through the withdrawal period of having to create everything any something new every day so um um i don't know why i don't know why i think it's some it has some kind of pleasure to it to know that that there was nothing and suddenly there's something and i always i always Tell that to the to the to the creators, to the real writers of the script and the ideas, and then go like, "What do you think about this? There was nothing. There was an idea in your mind, and now look at this. We built this house that now 
is there. <laughs> now these characters are dressed as, you know, real people and they're walking around and talking. What do you think about that? And they go like, oh yeah, you're right. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe it's something about that, you know? Maybe it's God complex. I don't know. I hope that, not. I wonder that myself yeah. very often. <laughs> like, But, what do you think I am? Then I go back to, to my house and I'm like that person again. I, I, I kind of be going like, yeah, let's paint it all red. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Right. Yeah. Uh, But yeah. yeah it's, I, it's funny when you get home, you're just dad right or, yeah. or friend or brother or whatever yeah. and yeah. yeah whenever I leave this space you know I go be mom and just yeah. be a normal person I, so you which yeah. is very important too it is because if we did nothing but create all the time I think our heads would be this big and we would just be cruising around being like I'm the king of all that I survey thank you very much <laughs> the the famous bored god complex right like move Move little thing. <laughs> I created you. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so it's a good thing we no, have I these regular think, lives. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's fun, and it's also I think it's even more fun when you do it with people, with with, with people, with other people, whatever, friends or not friends. Uh, that communication there, there's something really interesting. It's like playing music sometimes. You know, right. it's like a like a different uh, type of language that some people speak. And you can communicate and it's like, oh, look, and what if we do this to that? Yeah, that looks amazing. Whoa, well done. That's great. And what if we move the camera through it? Yeah, why not? That's great too. And uh, that kind of, I don't know. I mean, it's almost, almost like the pleasure you get when you are building Legos, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, you go piece by piece and then think that, 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 that. And suddenly you're, oh, I love this. Okay, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then you have to show everybody, did you see what I made? <laughs> There's a guy in there. It's amazing. <laughs> I have my kids for that. They go like, that is such a good Lego builder. Yep, yep. I just built an alien spaceship with my son yesterday. So. Nice, nice. Yep, I know how that goes. So, <laughs> all right. Everybody that was here today with us, Bobby, my mom was here today. Kelly, guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope that you will not only like this video, but share because I felt like this conversation with Pedro had so many interesting, I mean, so much good wisdom, so many insights, not just into cinematography and approaching a film, but art in general and how you use your creativity and where you source your ideas and all of that stuff. So if you know people who could benefit from hearing this great conversation, please share that with them. Um, the article will be out soon so be looking for that and tomorrow we will have emily teague here on the show she's a fashion photographer based in nice. new york so be here for that conversation